Herzlich willkommen zum nächsten Talk. Du kannst alles hacken. Welcome to the talk. You can hack everything, but just shouldn't get caught. So first of all, who has found a vulnerability of you uh, and had doubt about telling it due to fearing consequences? And who would want to find a vulnerability? All right. Well, you're certainly affected, and uh, this talk should be relevant for most of you. Most hackers are faced with the situation that they found something, they digged into something, and and know that people who own the architecture they've compromised that this uh, has some some consequences and they don't like what they've done. And this talk is about how to deal with such a situation and ideally not get in such a situation in the first place. Linus and Torsten are experts on IT security. And you might know them from a hack on the election software. Uh, they found some, some vulnerabilities in there. So, if you want to hear it in German, there's a podcast of Logbuch Netzpolitik. But for now, please enjoy the talk. Thank you very much for coming. Great that so many of you are here. And I appreciate that lots of you did the first mistake right now. Uh, by signing up, showing up for having hacked something. So actually, both of us have never hacked anything. So, yeah. So we've seen lots of hackers over the years uh, who had to go to jail. And there's lots of risk involved when, when hacking and who diminished the, the joy. So lots of like legal procedures kicked in doors and so forth. Really unnecessary things. And it might make sense to actually think about how you can still be free and also be free in the future. And we know hackers are just free free beings. And um, we really like you to stay free, paint beautiful pictures like free beings. And yeah, what this is basically about is OPSEC. OPSEC basically is depicted here nicely. Very nice teaching material from Russia. Um, that's also con a concern for them over there, apparently. And we also have... We would like to start with the very first computer warm. And you never should overestimate your uh, capabilities, uh, which is basically the first lecture already. We know this since the very first computer warm, the very first big warm that was also recognized internationally. Um, that was the Morris warm. Lots of uh, vulnerabilities in sent mails, fingers, as how were abused and also weak passwords to kind of to spread itself. And back then that, that led to a failure of parts of the internet in 1988. And some of you might ask, why is this worm called Morris Worm? Because his inventor, his founder, was pretty proud of this worm and told everyone how it, how it worked. And at some point he, he stood on campus at Harvard uh, on, a ch on a chair, on a table, and was just preaching about the worm he had developed. And, yeah, he basically just spread the word. Everybody heard about it, and somebody passed this info on to a journalist. And, well, he was faced with this, and the result of this is that this worm was named after him, but he had to... Um, he got fines, he had to go to... to prison and basically he could have avoided the whole thing without all this um, need of, of spreading the word about his work. The same actually applies to a bank robbers. This guy here, he robbed a bank 
And you know what? What do you do when you actually had have experienced something entertaining, something something great? Well, first of all, you take a selfie, right? You can also take a second one, or uh, photograph the people you've collaborated with, or like eat what you've what you got, and then well, this is basically the road straight to instant jail. And you might consider this just a one case example, just. Uh, if you actually keep looking, you'll find plenty of these ex examples and lots of experts who kind of make the most same mistakes. And it always ends the same way. You know, this guy here, <laughs> lots of uh, golden teeth, uh, this gentleman is, is displaying on a, on a picture. And basically, he was sentenced um, because he showcased all of this and this uh, legally obtained money on Facebook. So let's move on to car hacking and the pioneers of this uh, field. We again are we are faced with the same phenomenon. First, car hacks were pretty analog and pretty brute force. And the pioneers in this field were those two young guys. They had a major hack. A major hack. They basically just uh, broke a shield, a windshield and they stole an iPad from inside a track. So what do you do first after such a, such a deed? You go to a shop where you have Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi network and just start gaming with this iPad, this illegally obtained iPad. And they kind of realized, oh cool, you can even take pictures and, and videos with this iPad. This is my brother Dylan, also Money Team. This, my good people, is what we get from a good night's hustle. Well, and since they connected this iPad to the Wi-Fi of Burger King in this case, um, something happened and, well, it had to happen. And the owner of this uh, truck Das Video hat der Polizei übergeben. Handed over the video one week later to the police, and the police knew the two and, well, took care of the rest. Well, let's, let's go back to actually our main focus of the talk computer hacking after this quick uh, detour to the analog world. What can actually go wrong when you, as interested, internet user or online shopper, um, what can go wrong? You want to just buy, buy something online and start clicking around and then somehow click on a wrong icon or just get detracted in a way. And uh, actually we're, we're talking about a threat level here. Um, a threat level for the person hacking in a, in this case, online shop. So you, in this case, have a certain threat level, and this level um, rises if you if you are not using software anonymizing your activity or or other cases. And so you might think, um, well, I better use Tor in such a setting. Uh, with a software made for anonymi anonymizing your activity. And, well, potentially you will find a cross-site scripting. And, well, now the threat level slowly rises. You have Tor, you have Tor, but it, the threat level rises and rises. And if you put potentially find a more critical vulnerability like a SQL injection, and even a remote code execution uh, opportunity, and you'll see you see the threat level rises and goes up and up. And well, this is this is not more like very simple uh, hacking. It gets more serious, and you potentially even find some some cr credit card information. And this, this threat level has now risen to a pretty, pretty high level. And you know, 
once the threat level goes actually back rapidly, and this is when we talk about prison, because once you're in prison, things have been settled and uh, you can be sure that you won't get um, pursued again for this one deed. And basically, when we, when we look at this threat level, at the very first stage, you should have already used a software for anonymizing you. Because as the owner of the website you're trying to, to hack, um, they'll, get a, they'll get aware of, uh, of that activity and kind of start to, to trace back and they get suspicious. Yeah, so that actually happens pretty frequently. Like people say, oh, I found something and uh, well, I'll look more into this and by actually using Tor. And the main point here is you should have used Tor in the main case, in the first case. So you could also look at the uh, data privacy regulations that they have. And maybe you have a right to be forgotten. There are companies that only save their logs for seven days. Maybe you just need to wait. So generally, be careful when being a data traveler. This also applies to our friend Alberto from Uruguay, who at the afternoon was on his computer with his girlfriend, and he was looking at a cloud. And he said, oh, well, health data. Have they got an admin? Oops. Oops. You see, that was the oops. So he wrote a mail to Third Uruguay, central authority f of the country. This is about health records. And he received a uh, very fast a response by the director of CERT. So they took this very seriously. Maybe this wasn't so dramatic because the hacker wasn't really about to do anything, so this was maybe not that bad. For him, this was over. He had notified CERT, they had taken responsibility, they will deal with this. Alberto was to carry on with his life as normal, but then, after one year, he realized that, well, they closed the admin admin, but now they have unauthenticated file access. So maybe I'll just go and notify CERT. Again, some time passed, about two years of silence. He had already forgotten about this. And then the company that has those health records, they get an email from somebody saying, give us Bitcoin. And the person blackmailing them said that they had the health records and if they wouldn't transfer 15 Bitcoins in a certain amount of time, they would go to the press and publish the information on all, of all people who are HIV positive. I'm not sure the press would have been interested, but the police was certainly interested. You always need to think about the police. You can s identify them by these hats. <coughs> there is a star at the front of the hat. So, just so you don't forget. So somebody wants Bitcoin now. And f again, for a while, nothing happens. And then Alberto's door is kicked in. His house is searched. Again, brute force attempt, as we know it. And now this happens. The police can't believe their eyes when they enter this apartment because they find so many interesting things that they will say at a later press conference and talk about this and sort of exhibit all their findings. Look like this in the picture. Stacks of credit cards, blank credit cards, tend to not make the best impression. This is true for uh, the supermarket, but also in your uh, cupboard when the police comes around. Also card readers, 
Haben sie dann alles schön drapiert. So they set this up very nicely. Cards, card readers, everything. The question would be if the police actually thought about OPSEC and maybe censored the credit card numbers. We're never going to know. And of course, what you find at any hacker's or criminal's house, what do you find? Of course, the mask of Anonymous. So they find the mask they also exhibited. We don't have a mask with us. Strategic concerns and strategic uh, money reserves. And very telling, they found Bitcoin. Very telling. Und die wollte der Erpresser ja haben. And that's what the blackmailer wanted. So, case closed. One and one Bitcoin added up together. Verhör, ein paar Drohungen. So, questionings, threats, police incompetence. And what Alberto does is confessing falsely, hoping that during the following procedures he would meet competent people, but that hope was wrong. He spends eight months in jail, in prison, and he is left out on bail at the moment. He's very sure that he didn't do this because after responsibly dec disclosing information, you don't send a blackmail. Especially if it says, please transfer 15 bitcoins to the following account without actually giving the account or the wallet number. So as we have poked some fun at Alberto, we actually contacted him and he had to say a few things and we welcome him to our video screen. After spending eight months in prison, <laughs> I have to tell you that I learned many things. One of them was that I should know how to manage the truth. When, who, where, how much information you share are key elements in order to stay out of trouble. After hearing my story, people tell me that the learning is that they should not report security incidents. And for me, that is sad. Report them. I don't report them anymore because I was forced to. And that is the way that I managed the truth in my case. I hope to be there next year and share with you the outcome of my experience, which is crazy. So guys, keep on hugging. So the device that he was holding in the video that looked like an ISM jammer is just a very sad misunderstanding because the police hadn't taken it when they searched his house as well as 30 hard drives and he doesn't get those devices back because the police are saying that this was would take way too much time to look at everything. So what we learn is it makes kind of makes sense to keep 127001 as a very clean and tidy space. In the wrong eyes, looking at some devices that are taken from your house can be trouble. And they might just try some yeah, logins. Um, what else can give us away on a technical level? We've talked about how to incriminate yourself. Maybe people are too honest sometimes. But what are the threats that can get dangerous for us? I could say they're kind of a kind of metadata similar to fingerprints, as you can see here. Es gibt heute kaum noch Nowadays, there are almost no things that don't contain metadata. The question of how to avoid metadata and what can be done with metadata is very context-dependent. 
So we always have to look at the content, where the data was actually generated. So one of the most important things that you need to think about before even starting to hack anything, what traces am I going to leave? And this is the part where we want to try to address younger people or people who are just starting out to hack things, to give you some ideas, to think about which devices, which software I'm using, what traces do I leave. If I'm just at my computer, I'm going to leave traces. I have a smartphone that I'm carrying around with me. So where am I leaving logs? What are the identities that I leave? Even if I'm using pseudonyms or if I'm using anonymizers. And what technology do I use to stay anonymous? Pseudonyms, cryptographic keys that are used on multiple systems, which is a bad idea because cryptic cryptographic keys only exist once. That's kind of the idea. But if I just copy my VM and some host names or keys might be the same, leaving, making possible to trace back to me. Logs are one classic. There are always strategists who have fa files in TrueCrypt volumes because they heard that this is better but have enabled logging on their operating system level, which says which files were opened with what application. So the logs basically tell everybody what videos and files may be in the encrypted areas. And this feature, and for many people, this is just a feature. They just want to know and have access. It's less work. You need to type less. This might actually break your neck if you just want to use this operating system to just hack around a bit. The important thing is investigators or people after you can create identities of you, whatever pseudonym you're using, they can create profiles, they can analyze your coding style, your orthography, uh, your pseudonyms and in, in forums where you show off the people looking at the devices that they took during the search of your house. They're just going to look at how you deal with a terminal shell. They can find out how many experiences, how experienced you are with the operating system and also the coding style. So maybe if you leave back a functional extension to the kernel, this is going to be analyzed later. And there is software that does that. Same thing as uh, detecting plagiaries, plagiarized uh, works. And there's works about how to trace back binary code to the original author, basically to, for example, to attribute malware. And there are many things that you need to take care of. And basically, you need to find out yourself which tools you're using and what they and which side channels they open, which kind of telemetry, and how can I turn it off? There are the rules of the internet, written by anonymous. Nobody is really anonymous anymore, but we'll talk about that later. They have put down these rules. Tits or get the fuck out is one of the rules. One of the rules for the people who wanted to stay anonymous. This is a nice fail of a hacker uh, by the name of Warmer, who posted a picture of his girlfriend's breasts, and he was very proud. So even the police thought Titzer get the fuck out. So he took that picture with his iPhone and the photo included GPS metadata. So we award Warmer the Mario Bart Award for the most uh, superfluous OPSEC fail. Most gratuitous fail. 
fragen sich natürlich, wie geht denn überhaupt Anonymität? So, how do we do anonymity in the internet if even anonymous can't really do it? We don't want to be discovered. The problem is that our IP address tells a lot about our location. So we are looking for something that covers our IP address. So if we Google that, the first thing we found is VPN service providers. Want to be anonymous on the internet? Just use a VPN. As, uh, this advice is given often. So let's use a VPN. VPN provider. We connect to them. Might be an open VPN connection or whatever. So this means that our original source IP address is covered and hidden and nobody on the server can know the servers that we then connect to. So then we go to our target. In this case, it's an evil company that we want we to hack. And they're like, wow, what's going on? Weird traffic. Uh, it's a VPN endpoint. So what can we do? Are we, are we secure now? We just assume that the VPN provider is going to shut up and not disclose our IP address. We don't know them. We haven't met them. But so the idea was actually that we don't have to trust anybody. We don't want to trust anybody. Because what, what happens at the VPN provider? We have an account. We pay. We make payments. So they are not going to offer this for free. So they are probably going to have our email address, credit card data, Bitcoin wallet, whatever. Possibly there are logs, but we don't know. Maybe the VPN, VPN provider just enables a login option with the next operating system update. So this can happen. There can always be surveillance at the provider, at the provider level. And the problem is we don't want to trust anybody. So we just start at the beginning. In this case, it went wrong. So we're going to have to find a way where we don't have to rely or trust anybody else. We just don't want to. And we also need a different target. So maybe some sort of alternative. In case you don't know, this is the logo of the German right-wing party uh, Alternative for Deutschland. So this time we're going to use Tor. You may have heard of that. It's kind of easy. The traffic is just going to go through several nodes, encrypted multiple times. You're sending towards the Tor entry um, your traffic, which is encrypted multiple times. And now the Tor entry knows who you are but only in the message encrypted to the node um, it said which next node this traffic is to be passed on. This is going to be passed on. You can also configure this until you end up at the Tor exit. And the Tor exit is going to do the hacking. And if the target looks at this, then the Tor exit is going to know where the traffic came from but the middle node doesn't know anything and the entry knows who you are but the Tor entry doesn't know where your packets went, which way they went. So this is much better. You don't have to trust as many people because they just can't know. Unless, of course, you're dealing with a global attacker or a global enemy, which is bad for you but just for your small data journey, we don't have to issue travel warnings. Unless you're too stupid. So now we have the technical requirements to be safe and secure on the internet, but now our own intelligence comes into play. And this is the level where we need operational security. Before that, we don't really need to start or think about OPSEC. This is also what a student of Howard University thought. 
and they were not well prepared for the exams they had that day. So what you do, how can I actually make this exam not happen? There are not many options. One of the solutions that usually works is a bomb threat. We all know that. So here, our strategist at Harvard, he knows, they know how to use Tor. And they send their threat message saying in which rooms they planted bombs, of course, including the room where the exam was to take place. So this reaches Harvard, and what do they do? Of course, they call the police. Ah, look, they say, this has come over Tor. Dear Nock, just check if any of our students use Tor at the time in question. So, of course, everybody had to sign in by their names to the network, and this person got a free ride to the prison or to the police station. So if we hadn't signed on to the network and used Tor for this very limited space of time to write this email, this wouldn't have happened. So let's continue with uh, anonymizers. This is a, very, a topic that has been very important to the public discussion, hidden services. So we're going to turn the whole anonymization network on its head. We don't want to be anonymous as an attacker, we just want to hide our servers in the net. So we make people reach us through Tor. So the police agent has to go through Tor and at some point they, the packets arrive at our node. So our no packets are routed differently through Tor. So now we have a server on the internet that can be reached by many ways. And it's very hard or impossible to find out where this server is actually located. Always, of course, assuming that nobody controls the whole internet or we're just too stupid. So we can prevent some of that by not writing any logs on our hidden service. We don't use any known SSH keys. We only give a local network to our hidden service catching it or constricting it to a 10.08. Uh, and only the connection to our hidden service is done by the Onion router. So it cannot be connected to the internet like this. So even if it tried, if it tried to do a little ping, it could never escape to the big evil internet as you see, can see on the left. So now we have our hidden service and we're, we're very happy because the big evil internet can only reach us through Tor. If you know how to do this and have some ideas, this will take you about one or two days to set up. And then you can just become a drug lord. And now you can really screw up your own OPSEC again. So to stay with the topic of the darknet, in Germany, there was this guy who had built a forum and a marketplace. So running this kind of service costs money, so they asked for uh, money to be able to continue to offer those services. And those donations were collected as Bitcoin. Just, so I have a hidden, hidden service, uh, use Bitcoin, I'm in the darknet. This all fits together very well. So what do I do? So now we need to exchange our Bitcoin at some point. And get real silver. At some point, you might want to actually have some euro. So at some point, this anonymous money leaves the digital world and 
goes through a Bitcoin exchange and to your uh, bank account. And in this case, this is where it broke. <laughs> Because this uncovers your identity. Because we're actually using a German provider, a German Bitcoin exchange. And how could it be any different? Of course, they will actually disclose information who is the actual recipient and to whose bank account the money went. This is uh, leads us to the Satoshi Nakamoto Award for anonymous uh, payments or... Oh, this was a very well thought out donation platform. And what's interesting about this case is that there was some clean police work, no, they did their work without any, without prohibiting anonymizers, without saving data. So there were weapons traded on this platform and you can just say that the police in this case and they always nag about that they get no data anymore, that they need more, have actually done good work in this case without surveilling us all the time. Pretty nice, right? Yeah. So we can all stay anonymous, right? So we get some nice metadata that we can fall victim to. All right, now move on to Wi-Fi. Who's, who's using Wi-Fi in this room, actually? Uh -huh. Well, they used to say that you should, you should go to coffee places and use their Wi-Fi to do hacking. Well, Wi-Fi is not only anymore in your own apartment. Those, those signals are spreading way, way further. And some anonymous members got to learn that the hard way, because in front of his house, um, they placed a, a van to, to observe his network and just see when uh, there was a lot of activity. Even, even decrypted, um, they just traced the amount of traffic. When is their activity? And by, by knowing this, They were just correlating activity to to other uh, occurrences, and it turned out that was the case. And they managed by by knowing this volume, this activity amount, they were able to kind of um, trace trace those deeds back to him and uh, imprison him. So Ethernet, in fact, is also part of OPSEC. Another killer for anonymity is the possibility of a smartphone and uh, with its functionality like Bluetooth and so forth, it's, it's also leaving traces. There's actually the marketing companies That offer, that offer services to track MAC addresses of devices. Um, and every time you basically venture out and walk, walk around outside, you are leaving traces with a, with a mobile phone. But actually, you can, you, can, uh, you can change your MAC address, right? Yeah, that might be true, but your phone is not simply on. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't only know all the different Wi-Fi networks you're using. And even, even though you're, you're changing your MAC address from time to time, your device is, is sending out the probes of the different SSIDs that it has been logged in. And you might not count on that, but with, with this information, those deep probes 
it's pretty easy to identify you because you have a very unique profile that you're leaving, leaving out there. Well, actually, I'm. Um, I think I think we we got someone by like just looking on the street who has been in the darknet, just looking on the fourth entry. So kind of really unfortunate here. So this is very unfortunate. Um, the manufacturers of devices tr try to get rid of this by randomizing the MAC addresses, but just by logging into different Wi-Fi networks and by leaving those traces, it's pretty pretty easy to identify you. So, what's the main learning here? If you don't want to get tracked, then simply switch off your Wi-Fi capabilities once you once you leave your apartment or when hacking something, which which might occur. So let's move on to the next case. You know, sometimes I'm actually doing consulting, and this is an example from my work. Um, this is a case of uh, people who voluntarily paint trains. They volunteer their time and are interested in in judging their their actions and actually they had uh, they had mobile phones that they only use when on site for the client which uh, seemed nice when coming up with the idea and they in fact only they only use it on site at their clients and you know what? The police actually traces those different areas where mobile phones are active, and they realized, see, they they simply traced the the activity in the area where where those uh, people were active, and were simply able to to catch those guys because they were just waiting for the live tracking to show up the <coughs> the phone numbers that in the past occurred in the context of those sprayings. A uh, quick disclaimer, this is not uh, actually related to, to my clients, like this is from a random group of uh, sprayers. So, what happens after such, such a finding, such, an, uh, such a case? Um, the name of those groups, um, they are being actually connected to individuals and at some point there will be a day, like in five or in ten years, um, you might be able to trace all those activities back to, to one, one person. Like profiles are being created in the, in the background. And, you know, the more often you do this, the more riskier it gets. And, you know, if you've done it 19 times and it all, always went fine, you think like, okay, it's going to be fine again in the 20th occurrence. But actually, that's that might be not the case. And some organizations actually have done the same in the, in the digital realm. Well, the first lesson <laughs> overall is you should know your device. And you should be able to use the tools that you're using, like you should master them, not simply just download a tool that somebody recommended and somebody has read something about it. Like really know your device, deal with the technology, know the technology and use the one that you, you master best. For example, web browsers. It's a pretty important topic, like lots of web applications and uh, Lots of services you actually need to explore by using browsers. And today, actually, it, it doesn't matter what browser you're using. They all have certain vulnerabilities or certain, certain issues. For example, Mozilla. If you have a very popular extension installed and this extension changes the ownership and this new owner is uh, simply adding a tracking feature, which happens, which, which happen in cases. This, this can quickly reveal your identity and, and uh, be, be a risk. 
So always question what actually happens when you update an extension. It's worth looking at the ad ad business, the ad industry. Like they're really really good at tracing people, uh, like browser footprinting and and all that stuff. Uh, lots of different approaches um, to to profile people, comparable to those um, Wi-Fi Pro requests uh, used for profiling. The same actually applies to browsers. So be aware of this. And uh, how about using profiles that you can discard once you once you use them, or erase the data once you once you use them? Um, set up a new set up a new operation system from time to time, and be aware that certain data leaks of, of those browsers um, are are patched as quickly as possible. And, well, another advice here is to really disconnect things that you can disconnect from each other, like separate services and minimize the risk. And as an example, use one computer with the, it's like your, your hacking workstation on the left, like with different, uh, different software installed and uh, different measures that prevent data to be leaked outside. There might be still data leaks, like that who nicks can't, can't prevent, but it's uh, overall at least minimizing risks of like data being leaked accidentally. So, your devices. Let's have a look at your devices. Like, don't let people tell you certain things, like don't follow advice by people um, regarding certain operation systems. You should just use the system that you are well accustomed with, that you, that you know well. Uh, you master that system and that's basically the way to go. And laziness actually is also a pretty big killer of anonymity. Like you, you gotta be you got to look into the future when doing OPSEC. I'm using Tor no matter what. Like even if I'm doing simple online shopping, just to, just to be sure to not leave any trace due to laziness. You never know. There, there might be a target server that is blocking Tor exit nodes. You know, that happens from time to time. Or captures are just simply more and more a pain once you once you once you use a Tor exit node. And those are all measures to basically get you to a point where you switch off Tor and for a moment not conceal your anonymity. And this this laziness uh, might actually cost you your identity. Well, in the future, we might see canneries more often. There was a talk actually last year um, on canneries and embedded devices. Well, it's basically any certain patterns that are being uh, left and that uh, are being monitored for. Like if somebody is googling for those patterns, it's comparable to a, like a honeypot approach with a, a database with certain data inside and a attacker that is that is using this data later on in a different in a different setting, like researching the patterns in my honeypot data, uh, trying to gauge the the worthiness, the, the, the value of the data he obtained. And th those approaches might also be pretty dangerous for for anonymity and revealing your identity. So always be skeptical, be aware that there might be traces and people are trying to get at you and actually place traps along the way. You know, in other cases, uh, somebody is uh, somebody's installing this smart meter or is coming along with a smart meter. This is, this is a device, this is now being installed as we speak in the digital first uh, euphoria and 
well, this is actually collecting lots of data, but I mean, no worries, you know, it has been certified by an authority like the German Internet Security Authority. So, no worries, right? But, well, nevertheless, we, we recommend to not use those kind of devices and uh, we're pretty skeptical uh, what, what more devices will be come up in the future that reveal lots of metadata. Well, it's also worth looking at yourself and your characteristics. Like, are you lazy? It's like you're kind of not skeptical enough. If things have turned out well in after 19 times, you just trust things that that turned out positive in the past, and you just you just make assumptions. Like nobody will look at this log because nobody has looked at it until now, and always, always um, ask yourself if if this is actually um, a, a good approach and, and you shouldn't, shouldn't spread too much information. That's something we, we talked about earlier. Like if you go on, go out partying, are you a person that likes to brag, likes to talk about your great achievements? So this is also a pretty big weakness for, um, for your anonymity. Well, let's look again at some kind of features and your, your way of conducting yourself. It's like your grandma style. It's um, your way of writing in an online forum. Technical skills that, that are pretty unique, that only a few people have and, and showcase. And investigators will, will look at those kind of unique skills and try to trace them back to just a, the, the few people opt, uh, opt having them, featuring them. You might leave along uh, something along the way, certain functions and things that, that are simply stay on the machines that the, you have been on. And those things are, are being traced back to you and investors are looking at this very thoroughly. And in addition to that, just take a deep breath, try to do these things a bit more discreetly, stay under the radar, don't brag, don't make illusions, don't be overconfident is one of the most important points. Also, this money question, don't be greedy. Money's not going to make you happy anyway. And I believe that if you've been hacking for years, this is a very dangerous thing to become overconfident. Just act like you recommended to act to your parents. Don't click any links that are sent to you by spam. Don't click on any attachments. And don't be silly, and careless. One of the telling weaknesses is a case from the context of Anonymous. So your buddy has a kid and a family and is uh, liable to be blackmailed and pressured and might just tell about you. This is Phineas Fischer. Nobody knows what they look like. Nobody knows if this is one or more person. And this pseudonym is somebody who hunts uh, Trojans, um, opened the Gamma 5 team, and all investigations were dropped because there were no traces of this person or this hacker and we give we want to give the hat tip to this person of course so our conclusions 
Pseudonymity is not anonymity. Don't tell about your plans. Never be in a situation where you have to trust somebody. Be paranoid before and not after the fact. Know your devices. Separate activities and devices. It makes a lot of sense to have a variety of device devices, especially if you're searched like Alberto, if you have many devices and they only take parts or some of them, you might be left with with some other devices. And don't touch cybercrime. There were people who were better than you and didn't make it. Forget about Bitcoin, it's dropping. So just leave it be. And then we only have one thing left to advise you. Never hack without a uh, ski mask. And not without ethics. And there was a talk about an introduction to the hacker ethics on the first day. Just save yourself some trouble. Work on the light glowing side of the force and you're not going to be in trouble. Thank you. I have one too. It's going to be...